Hey guys, this is Vyom Joshi with Superior North. Welcome back to my channel. Today we will be talking about one of the securities that was suggested by a subscriber. The company is called Posco. Posco is a South Korean company, which is also the third largest steel producer in the world. Its output back in 2019 was at 49.2 million tons, with a capacity utilization rate of 89.7%. Its major markets include construction, automobile, and electrical appliances. Its principal products are stainless steel, silicon sheet steel, and hot and cold rolled products. It exported about 62.7% of its 2019 sales. Now that we have a brief understanding of POSCO's business, let's review the fundamentals. Today, we will be reviewing POSCO's key ratios, looking at the DCF discounted free cash flow analysis to find the intrinsic value of the company, and finally do an expected rate of return calculation to see if we were to invest in POSCO at the current stock price, what kind of return can we expect to get on this investment? So let's dive in and review POSCO. Hey guys, let's start off by looking at the key ratios. I'm on Morningstar for POSCO under key ratios, the financials. First item on the list is the revenue. The revenue is the top line of the income statement. This number gives an idea of how much money is generated from the company's sales. Most of the numbers here that we'll see are going to be in South Korean won, which is the company's local currency. Back in 2010, POSCO's revenue was about 60 trillion won. In 2019, it was about 64 trillion won. And for the trillion 12 months, it's about 59 trillion won. We can see that over the past 10 years, POSCO's revenue has fluctuated between 50 and 60 trillion won. Next, looking at the gross margin. The gross margin gives us an idea of how much of the company's revenue is retained once it has paid for the cost of goods. Back in 2010, the gross margin was about 15%. For the year 2019, it was about 9.8%. And for the trailing 12 months, it's about 7.7%. We can see that the gross margin has been declining since 2017. So what this 9.8% gross margin in 2019 means is every $100 that POSCO made from sales in 2019, by the time it paid for the cost of goods, which accounts for the materials, the labor that goes into making the inventory, by the time the company paid for those expenses, it only had $9.8 left. Ideally, we want to see the gross margin to be a big number because we want to see the company retain as much cash as possible after paying for all those goods. Next, looking at the operating income. The operating income gives us an idea of how much money is generated from the company's core business. The way we calculate the operating income is we start off with the revenue, and then we subtract the cost of goods and the operating expenses from that number. We can see that back in 2010, the operating income was about 5.7 trillion won. For the year 2019, it was about 3.9 trillion won. And for the chilling 12 months, it was about 2.1 trillion won. When we look at the past 10 years, we can see that the operating income follows a similar trend as the revenue. In other words, when the revenue increased, the operating income increased. And when the revenue decreased, the operating income decreased. Next, looking at the net income. The net income gives an idea of how much money is left with the company once it has paid for the cost of goods, the operational expenses, the interest on its obligations, taxes, and so forth. We can see that back in 2010, the net income was about 4.1 trillion won. In 2019, it was about 1.8 trillion won. And for the chilling 12 months, it's about 981 million won. It's interesting to note that the US tariffs went into effect in 2018. So we do see a lower net income number in 2018. However, when we look at the past 10 years, we can see that the net income has always stayed positive, which is certainly something we want to see with the company. Next, looking at the dividends. We can see that back in 2010, POSCO paid about 2,427 won as dividend. And for the year 2019, it paid about 2,403 won as its dividend. For the past 10 years, we can see that POSCO has consistently paid dividends between 1,800 to 2,500 won range. So that is certainly something we want to see as shareholders, a company paying consistent dividends over many years. Next, looking at the shares outstanding. We can see that back in 2010, POSCO had about 308 million shares outstanding. That number grew to about 320 million shares in 2015. We can see that from 2010 through 2015, POSCO's shares outstanding increased, which goes to show that the company was most likely doing some equity financing during that period. From 2015 all the way through 2019, the shares outstanding stayed the same at 320 million shares. And for the chilling 12 months, we see a dip in the shares outstanding, which is now sitting at 319 million shares. This goes to show that over the past 12 months, the company appears to have bought back some of its shares. This is certainly something we want to see with the company. We want to be investing in companies that are buying back its shares as it helps increase the existing shareholders' ownership within the company. 
After that, looking at the book value per share, the way Morningstar calculates its book value is it subtracts the total liabilities that the company has from its total assets. We can see that back in 2010, Postco's book value was about $100 per share. For the year 2019, it was about $120 per share. And for the trailing 12 months, it's about $125 per share. We can see that Postco's book value over the past 10 years has hovered between $100 to about $125 per share. Finally, looking at the free cash flow, the free cash flow is what we get when we subtract capital spending from the company's operating cash flow. We can see that the free cash flow was negative from 2010 all the way through 2014, primarily because the capital spending exceeded the company's operating cash flow. We can see that back in 2015, the free cash flow was about 4.7 trillion won. For the year 2019, it's about 3.1 trillion won. And for the trailing 12 months, it's about 4.6 trillion won. Ideally, we want to see the free cash flow trend to be positive and steady, if not growing. I will be using the past 10 years of free cash flow for my expected rate of return calculation. And I will be using the 2019 figure of 3.185 trillion won for my DCF discounted free cash flow analysis. Next, looking at the profitability of the company, the first item we'll look at is the net margin. The net margin compares the company's net income to its revenue. So it's comparing the bottom line to the company's top line. We can see that back in 2010, Postco's net margin was about 6.9%. And for the year 2019, it was about 2.87%. What this means is every 100 won that Postco made from its sales, by the time it paid for the taxes, interest, cost of goods, expenses, and so forth, it only had about $2.87 left as pure profit. The net margin numbers that we see here are fairly similar to what the competitors have. Next, looking at the return on equity. The return on equity compares the company's net income to its shareholders' equity. Warren Buffett prefers to invest in companies that have a return on equity of 8% or greater every year for the past 10 years. We can see that back in 2010, Postco's return on equity was about 12.7%. For the year 2019, it's about 4.23%. We can see that ever since 2012, Postco's return on equity has been in single digits. Next, looking at the return on invested capital. This number gives us an idea of how good the management is at investing the capital and getting a return on that investment. Back in 2010, the return on invested capital was about 8.9%. For the year 2019, it's about 3.28%. We can see that the return on invested capital follows a similar trend as the return on equity. Finally, looking at the interest coverage, the interest coverage compares the company's income to its interest obligations. Back in 2010, the interest coverage was about 9.13 times. For the year 2019, it was about 5.14 times. Benjamin Graham, the father of value investing, preferred to only invest in securities that had an interest coverage of five times or greater. And for the year 2019, the 5.14 times means that Postco has enough income to pay off its interest obligations 5.14 times using its 2019 income. Now let's look at the financial health of the company. Focusing on the liquidity measures, the first item on the list is the current ratio. The current ratio compares the company's current assets to its current liabilities. Ideally, we want to see the current ratio to be greater than one. A current ratio greater than one means that the company has enough oxygen in its system to survive for another 12 months. You can see that back in 2010, Postco's current ratio was 1.59. And for the year 2019, it was about 2.12. We can see that over the past 10 years, the current ratio has always stayed above 1.0. Next, looking at the quick ratio, the quick ratio is similar to the current ratio, except we disregard the inventory. In other words, quick ratio is equal to current assets minus inventory divided by the current liabilities. It would be best if we have quick ratio greater than one, since that means that the company does not have to rely on selling its inventory in order to stay liquid. Back in 2010, Postco's quick ratio was 0.9. And for the year 2019, it's about 1.39. Next, looking at the financial leverage. We can see that back in 2010, Postco's financial leverage was about 1.95 times. And for the year 2019, it was about 1.79 times. We can see that over the past 10 years, Postco's financial leverage has stayed fairly consistent. Finally, looking at the debt to equity ratio, this number compares the company's debt to its shareholders' equity. Back in 2010, Postco's debt to equity ratio was a 0.3. And for the year 2019, it was about 0.28. Similar to the financial leverage, we can see that the debt to equity ratio has stayed fairly consistent over the past 10 years. Next, looking at the efficiency ratios. The first item on the list is the day sales outstanding. 
This number gives an idea of how many days go by from the day the company recognizes its sales to the day it actually receives cash. We can see that back in 2010, Postco's day sales outstanding is at 43 days. And for the year 2019, it's about 51 days. For the chilling 12 months, it's about 60 days. What this means is it takes Postco 60 days from the day it recognizes its sales to when it actually receives cash. Next, looking at the day's inventory, this number gives us an idea of how many days does Postco's products set in the inventory before they're sold. We can see that 2010 was an exceptional year when the number was 53 days. In 2011, that number was 67 days. And for the year 2019, it was 73 days. Trailing 12 months, it was 70 days. We can see that from 2011 through the trailing 12 months, the number has hovered between 66 through 75 days. Next, looking at the payables period, this number gives an idea of how many days does Postco take to pay its suppliers. We can see that that number back in 2010 was about 30 days. And for the year 2019, it's about 28 days. We can see that the trend for the payables period has been fairly consistent over the past 10 years. Finally, looking at the inventory turnover, this number gives us an idea of how many times does Postco's inventory go through its system in a calendar year. Back in 2010, Postco's inventory went through its system about 6.89 times. And for the year 2019, it was about 5 times. And for the chilling 12 months, it's at 5.24 times. This means that Postco's inventory went through its system about 5.24 times in the past 12 months. Now let's look at the current valuation for the company. Over here, we will be comparing Postco to the S&P 500. The S&P 500 is the aggregate of the top 500 companies in the United States. The first item on the list is the price to earnings ratio. We can see that Postco's PE ratio is about 22.3 as compared to the S&P 500 which is at 27.2. Postco's price to book ratio is at 0.5 whereas S&P 500 is at 3.8. Postco's price to sales ratio is at 0.4 whereas S&P 500 is at 2.7. Postco's price to cash flow is at 2.7, whereas S&P 500 is at 15.8. And finally, Postco's dividend yield is at 2.5%, whereas S&P 500 is at 1.7%. So we can see that on all these valuation metrics, Postco is undervalued when compared to the S&P 500. Hey guys, now let's look at the discounted free cash flow DCF analysis for Postco. Over here, I pasted the 2019 free cash flow number that I got from Morningstar which is actually 1.385 trillion won. I divided that number by 1100 since the current exchange rate is one US dollar being equal to 1100 South Korean won, which equates to about $2,896 million for my 2019 free cash flow number. I'm using an annual growth rate of 2%. What this means is I'm assuming that Postco's free cash flow will grow at 2% every year for the next 10 years. I'm using a discount rate of 10%. What this means is I want this investment to yield me a 10% return. I'm using the long-term growth rate to be 1%. What this means is I expect Postco's free cash flow to grow at 1% every year from the 10-year mark into perpetuity. Postco has 319 million shares outstanding and Postco's long-term debt is $10,811 million. I got this from Postco's balance sheet off of Morningstar. After taking all of these inputs into account, we get the intrinsic value to be about $72 per share. When we compare this intrinsic value to the current stock price of about $61.30 per share, we can see that the current stock price is trading at a discount. That is, the current stock price is about 85% of the intrinsic value. The way we derive this intrinsic value is we look at what the free cash flows would be every year for the next 10 years. We sum up all those free cash flows, which come out to about $19.5 billion. Then we look at what the free cash flows would be from the 10-year mark into perpetuity and sum all those up to get the intrinsic value to be about $33.7 billion. From that number, we subtract the long-term debt and divide by the shares outstanding to get the intrinsic value to be about $72 per share. Now, if we disregard the perpetuity component, in other words, if we only think that Postco is going to grow for the next 10 years and then stop, then we get the intrinsic value to be about $27 per share. The way I calculated this is I looked at what the free cash flows would be for the first 10 years. From that number, I subtracted the long-term debt and divided by the shares outstanding to get the intrinsic value without the perpetuity component to be about $30 per share. Hey guys, now let's look at the expected rate of return calculation for Postco. Over here, I pasted the past 10 years of free cash flows that I got from Morningstar. 
I had to change the currency from South Korean won to US dollars and I did so by dividing South Korean won by 1100 since one US dollar is equal to about 1100 South Korean won. This is the yearly free cash flow trend that we get. We can see that the free cash flows have been positive every year from 2015 through now. Looking at the future data and predictions, I'm assuming that there's a 15% likelihood that Postco's free cash flow will grow at 5%, there's a 50% likelihood that its free cash flow will grow at 2%, and there's a 35% likelihood that its free cash flow will decline at 8%. These are the potential free cash flow rates that we get into the future. After taking into account the numbers of shares outstanding, which is 319 million shares, at the current stock price of about $61.30 per share, we can expect to get a return of about 9.9%. In other words, if we were to invest our money in POSCO at the current stock price of about $61.30 per share, we can expect to get a return of about 9.9% on this investment. Hey guys, now let's wrap it all up. We saw that POSCO's revenue, operating income, as well as net income for the past 10 years have been positive, predictable, and steady. The dividend payouts have been consistent every year for the past 10 years. The return on equity has been subpar. The interest coverage has been greater than five times. The current ratio and the quick ratio both show that POSCO is fairly liquid. The financial leverage and the debt to equity ratio point out that POSCO is not over leveraged and its debt is certainly manageable. After that, we saw that POSCO's efficiency has stayed steady over the past 10 years. From a valuation standpoint, we saw that POSCO is undervalued when compared to the S&P 500. Next, when we performed the discounted free cash flow DCF analysis, we saw that the intrinsic value of this company comes out to about $72 per share. We compared it to the current stock price of about $61.30 per share. We can see that the current stock is trading at a discount of about 15% below the intrinsic value. After that, when we did the expected rate of return calculation, we saw that if we were to invest in POSCO at the current stock price, we can expect to get a return of about 10% on this investment. Lastly, after reviewing the fundamentals, we can see that POSCO does provide a decent exposure to a foreign investment and foreign currency. With the increase in government spending and infrastructure spending, we can be fairly certain that POSCO would see an increase in its sales, primarily because steel happens to be a raw material for many of the infrastructure projects. Hey guys, that is all I have for you this week. Hopefully you found this video on POSCO interesting. Please do like, share, comment, and subscribe to my channel. And if you have any recommendations as to which stock I should review next, please leave it in the comment section below. I will greatly appreciate it. Thank you.